a picture postcard setting. For tourists the world over, the Caribbean islands are the very image of a tropical paradise with the palm trees gently waving in the breeze to the beat of calypso music. Strung out over nearly 2,000 kilometers between North and South America, we have in the North the Greater Antilles, Cuba, Haiti, Dominican Republic, and Puerto Rico, and in the South, the Lesser Antilles, a multitude of small islands stretching all the way down to the coast of South America. Traveling down the Orinoco or the Amazon rivers, the indigenous populations migrated north in successive waves to the shore of the sea. They then settled one island after another, and at the term of this migration that lasted several thousand years, they had populated all the islands of the Greater and Lesser Antilles. Under the domination of the Tainos, the Arawaks, and the Caribs, the region enjoyed a sort of cultural unification. When the Europeans arrived, their world shattered. The Spaniards, who came in the wake of Christopher Columbus, colonized the Greater Antilles, and from there set out on their conquest of South America. The English, Dutch and French, who embarked on the colonial adventure later, fought for the control of the Lesser Antilles. In a few years, these islands would be a mosaic of colonies, each with its own navy, its own language, and its own laws. A tropical Europe implanted in the heart of the Caribbean Sea. During the colonial period, it was much easier to go from Seville to Cuba, from London to the Barbados, or from Nantes to Martinique than to sail from one island to another. Cruising the sea routes of the conquistadors, the pirates, and the slavers, we're going to try to rediscover the traces of the Taino Indians. This is the chronicle of a voyage in quest of a legendary maritime route, the Trans-Caribbean. Port Everglades, Florida. Every winter, the same frenzy takes hold of this port near Miami. Gigantic cruise ships are getting ready to hoist anchor. The sky is alive with airplanes. It's the cruise season. In a few hours, we'll be heading for the Caribbean islands, like these passengers. But while we're waiting to leave, let's take a little tour of Miami. Miami is the world cruise capital. Every year, millions of travelers embark for the Caribbean here, so the cruise ships have become part of the landscape. a surprising marriage of glass and steel. The cruise boom dates from the 1980s. This activity here owes a lot to Miami's geographical situation. The city is turned towards the Caribbean Sea, as well as South America. And it's surely the same reason that led the Indians to settle here several thousand years ago. Water, maritime activity, has really defined this area, especially before it became an incorporated city. That is, if you go back thousands of years, the early peoples who lived here, the Dequesta Indians, they lived right next to the sea. They didn't engage in farming, so they fished. That was one of their major sources of food. Another thing was there were a lot of trees along the water that bore fruit, and they would pick those berries, and that was another part of their diet. And they built these great canoes, and they would travel from one place to another. We think they were great traders. They used those canoes to go from one point to another point, that is from, say, Miami to parts of the Caribbean uh, by boat. 
So uh, I think water has defined this area from its very beginnings. Miami developed very slowly. Miami is really a 20th century city. There were only nine people living on the Miami River in 1895, but then the railroad entered Miami in 1896 and connected it with other parts of the United States, and that was the beginning of what we call modern Miami. Thanks to the railroad, Americans from New York, Boston, Philadelphia, and all the major cities of the East Coast could discover Florida's sunshine. Starting in the 1920s, hotels and residents sprouted up all along the shore, making Miami Beach a city dedicated to Art Deco. With more than 400 mansions, hotels, and stores built between 1920 and 1930, the South Beach District is a unique collection of architectural specimens. A number of aesthetic tendencies were in vogue during that period, but the style called modern nautic, with its large porthole-like windows inspired by the great ocean liners of the 1930s, is without a doubt the most impressive. The Americans from the Northeast were followed by a new wave of immigrants who flocked to Miami after the Second World War. The Miami people are a mix of a lot of people. This is predominantly now a Spanish-speaking area. There are people here from many islands in the Caribbean, many parts of Central America, many parts of South America. There's so many people who've come from the Caribbean to start new lives here that many people regard this as the northernmost Caribbean major city. Cuba, the largest of the Caribbean islands, is less than 200 kilometers from the coast of Florida. In 1959, following Fidel Castro's rise to power, nearly 300,000 Cuban refugees arrived in the United States. And Miami saw the birth of a new district, Little Havana. In the Maximo Gomez Park, named after a Cuban hero of the liberation from Spain in the 19th century, a few of the first emigres get together to play chess and dominoes and talk about the old country. Cubans come here, get their refugee status, and then they go back to Cuba. Why? What can they possibly hope for there? I have no one left in Cuba, just my son and my father who are buried there. The desire of people from the Caribbean to start new lives in Miami is a, it's a constant push. Most of the people who come here illegally come here by boat, small boat, and it's a very difficult passing. When you pass the Straits of Florida coming from Cuba or even Haiti, uh, it's very perilous. Those waters there are very choppy. And a lot of times they get over here, a lot of times they don't get over here. Lots of people have lost their lives crossing the Straits, probably thousands in the last many years. At Port Everglades, it's time to weigh anchor. The lights of the city fade slowly into the distance. Our course is due south. Our trans-Caribbean voyage is underway. Since the second half of the 20th century, the Caribbean has in fact come under the domination of the USA. This domination is seen in how much the local economies are dependent on tourism. In this context, all the islands, even the smallest, are trying to attract the cruise ships. 
But the days of freebooting and piracy are long gone. There's no longer any need to attack the ships. It's enough to invite them to call in at the port. We're always looking for opportunities to help the communities of those destinations, to help the governments of those destinations, and to not just make it an economic transaction, but to make it a very fruitful and rewarding experience for not only the cruise line passengers, but also for the people who inhabit the islands of the destinations we call. Because of the politics, none of the boats puts in at Cuba, but all the companies are preparing for that eventuality. It's premature for us to think that anything will happen soon. There are going to be probably a few more years before the political environment is resolved to a point where there could be some discussion about how one would go about offering cruises to uh, Cuba. But when that day comes, we'll certainly, as most other cruise lines, we'll certainly look at how we can include that as an option to our itineraries. These political economic problems are the furthest thing from the passengers' minds. They're here to have a good time. Until the American ships are authorized to put in at Cuba, they have to go around the vast island to reach the Dominican Republic. We can choose between two routes. We usually take the shortest, the most direct. And then there's the outside route. We leave from Port Everglades. We cross the Northeast Channel, Providence Channel, then we come out into the Atlantic. That route is more dangerous because you often have headwinds and you run into bad weather. Plus, with that route, we do an additional 50 miles. But, as we can get our speed up rather high, we prefer the outer route if the weather is good. But if it's bad, we take the inner route. This is our captain, Giacomo Romano from Italy. It's really a pleasure to have you all. How are you? Giacomo Romano and his senior officers. On the morning of our second day out, we're approaching the shores of the Dominican Republic and the port of La Romana, our first stopover. The maneuvers of the huge cruise ship entering the little port of La Romana are carried out 
as befits the Dominican Republic, to the rhythms of merengue. Even in its watered-down tourist version, the merengue, with its African and Amerindian percussion and its accordion from Europe, incarnates the entire history of this island made known to the world by Christopher Columbus on his first voyage in 1492. After he had explored Cuba for a month, Columbus's fleet sailed into view of another island on December 6, 1492. He baptized it La Española in honor of the Spanish sovereigns. This island, which would later be called Hispaniola as a result of a mistaken transcription, was then populated by Taino Indians. Taino was the name of the ethnic group that Columbus encountered when he arrived in the Antilles. The Taino society was not very large. It was a society composed of small villages with a small population. There were public squares, cemeteries, but it was fairly poor, economically weak. It was a society of fishermen and gatherers. You could say they were almost marginal societies with regards to the great societies of Mexico or the Andes. It was an animistic society with many gods, even though there was a main god, the god of Yucca, with its manioc. The petroglyphs were ritual paintings. In certain caverns, you can see images of nature, the flora and fauna. They were, in fact, votive offerings to the gods to ask for their blessings. It was a very religious society where the cacique had the powers of a priest. And there were also priests and medicine men who held power. One million Tainos were living on this island when the Spanish arrived. Forty years later, ravaged by disease and massacred, there were no more than a few hundred. In the 16th century, the colony started producing sugar. At the beginning of the 18th century, Santo Domingo, as it was then called, controlled 70% of the world's sugar trade. It was a rich economy, based on the forced labor of 500,000 African slaves. A black Spanish-speaking population. The whole history of Santo Domingo is here to be seen in the streets of the city and the alleys of the central market.
The conquistadors built a city on the fertile lands where the Indians once lived. Christopher Columbus's eldest son, Don Diego Columbus, who ruled Santo Domingo from 1508 on, had the Alcazar constructed. It was the seat of his power during the conquest. But what remains of the Taino's heritage? The name of a river, a plant, a fruit? The vague reminiscence of a lost paradise where man once lived in harmony with nature. When the colonial city was founded in 1496 by Bartholomew Columbus, the brother of Christopher Columbus, the first buildings were constructed with very basic materials, like palms. They were the same materials that were used in the constructions of the Taino. The city, which was destroyed by a hurricane, was then reconstructed in stone under the supervision of Nicolas de Ovando, the first governor of the colony. But the Columbus family were the main actors of Santo Domingo's history. Religious buildings, hospitals, and monasteries sprouted up in the city of Santo Domingo, the capital of the East Indies, and it became the most important port of call for all the conquistadors, like Hernando Cortes and Francisco Pizarro, en route to Mexico or Peru. The Caribbean Sea and the riches of the New World soon attracted adventurers. So fortifications were constructed to protect Santo Domingo from attacks by pirates and freebooters. A little later, they erected other constructions to defend the city, like the Ozama Fortress. It was constructed to resist the raids of the pirates and freebooters who were after all the riches that were being transported by the ships setting sail from Santo Domingo to Spain. Santo Domingo is no longer the leading city of the New World. That period has now faded into the mists of time. Even though the tourists still come to admire the marvels of the past, the Dominicans live very much in the present time. Take baseball, for example. This game, imported from the United States, is a veritable craze here. Santo Domingo in our wake and carry on with our voyage across the Caribbean heading for San Juan, Puerto Rico, our next port of call.
on board, restaurants, casino, music hall. The party is in full swing. But in spite of all that, at this very moment, the real show is a few decks up. The lights of San Juan have just appeared on the horizon. Over the past few years, San Juan, situated in the heart of the Greater and Lesser Antilles, has become a major port of call for cruises. Gentle giants, Trojan horses of the new millennium, the cruise ships are massed at the gates of old San Juan. In the Caribbean, the sea was for a long time a source of danger. Pirates and buccaneers would prowl around the islands on the lookout for Spanish galleons loaded with gold from Peru or silver from Mexico. More than anywhere else in the Greater Antilles, the Spanish protected the island by constructing fortresses at all the strategic points. In 1595, Sir Francis Drake, the famous privateer, launched an attack on Fort San Felipe de Moro. In vain. But in fact, the Spanish were more worried about the other colonial powers than pirates. Puerto Rico was situated in a very strategic position. It was the gateway that protected Cuba, Santo Domingo, and all the greater Antilles from the assaults of the English, the French, and the Dutch, who occupied the lesser Antilles. In the course of the 19th century, the Spanish colonies of South America gained their independence. The last Spanish possession, along with Cuba, was Puerto Rico, and it was ceded to the United States after the short Spanish-American War in 1898. In 1917, the Puerto Ricans were granted U.S. citizenship. I'm Puerto Rican because I was born here, but I'm American because this territory belongs to the United States. People like me fought in the Korean War. We identify with the American people. We shed our blood fighting for the freedom of all American citizens, those in Puerto Rico, as well as all the others. Along with our brothers of the Dominican Republic and Cuba, we make up one people. We love each other like brothers because we share a common language, Spanish. We have a good relationship with them, so we're very unified. That's why we go over to the Dominican Republic often, but unfortunately not to Cuba because of the political situation. It's a bit tricky, but the Dominicans come over here and we go over there. We've left Puerto Rico. During the night, we passed the Anglo-American Virgin Islands. All during the 17th century, these islands were the hideout of pirates preying on the Spanish convoys that passed this way to catch the favorable winds on their return voyage to Europe. In the morning, we're nearing San Martin, our first stop in the Lesser Antilles. 
This island, which is now half French, half Dutch, started actively developing its tourist trade in the early 1960s. With the construction of an international airport and more recently a port for cruise ships, Sint Maarten, the Dutch side, chose to go for mass tourism. And this, of course, brings certain problems with it. There is a certain amount of congestion because of the reinforced security measures on account of the recent terrorist activities. And that causes some inconvenience for the passengers, who have long waiting lines every time they disembark. And especially at Saint-Martin, where there's only one wharf and you can see there are four cruise ships here now, and those four ships can land up to 10,000 passengers. What a sight! A street lined with buildings several dozen meters high. A street that completely changes its aspect with the arrivals and departures of the cruise ships. There's nothing virtual about this site, just the opposite. It's all organized, planned, marketed to welcome the passengers and channel them towards the streets of Philipsburg, the capital of Sint Martin, and the center for the duty-free shops. <laughs> While private investors have for the most part opted for Saint Martin, Marigot, the capital of French Saint Martin, decided to choose another clientele. Upmarket tourism with small, quaint hotels and gourmet restaurants. Not a single cruise ship in sight. Only yachts and luxury pleasure boats are welcome in the marina of Fort Louis. This type of boat usually belongs to fairly wealthy people, bankers or businessmen, because these boats cost a lot. The upkeep, fuel, the personnel. The latest fashion is to have a backup boat to go fishing. So on this yacht, we have a 30-foot boat completely rigged for deep-sea fishing. We regularly go out early in the morning for deep-sea fishing. We also have jet skis and different devices like that to entertain the owner. Today, the island's economy is entirely based on tourism. But between the giant cruise ships of Saint Martin and the luxury yachts of Saint Martin, is there any space left for the local seamen? The fish served in the restaurants of Marigot, is it shipped in by plane from the far corners of the planet, or are there still fishermen here on the island? We're about seven fishermen who officially make a living from the sea, and for the others, it's pretty hard. Without the boon of tourism, we'd be finished. Yeah. 
Elle est dans la petite maison à côté. We've always practiced small-scale traditional fishing here. Since there aren't many fishermen, there's no organization to back us up, like the cooperative they have in Guadeloupe. There are no local craftsmen to build fishing boats for us, so we have to manage as best we can. It's a constant struggle for us because Saint Martin is a little like Guadeloupe's neglected little sister. We live very well for six months of the year, and for the other six months, we have to make do. Every year we're tempted to give it all up and go into the charter business. But fishing is in our blood. And besides, someone has to go out and catch the fish. We're part of a small number of Frenchmen that represent French fishing on this part of the island. We have to stick it out, defend the French colors. The huge cruise ship that brought us to Saint Martin has turned around and is heading back to Florida. So we'll be continuing our voyage through the Caribbean Sea on board another boat, a four-mast sailing ship. The Star Paper under full sail is headed for Nevis, a former English possession that federated with St. Kitts became independent in 1993. The Star Clipper is the heir of the Greyhounds of the Sea, as the Clippers were called. With their sleek lines, these swift sailboats crisscrossed the seven seas during the latter half of the 19th century. They carried tea from Ceylon or wool from Australia to London. The captain of the Star Clipper has a much more modest mission, take his passengers through the Lesser Antilles, starting with Nevis. The Nevis, uh, it's uh, rather not uh, called by the big cruise liner, as uh, uh, there is no pier for such a big ship. Sometimes the little sm smaller one are coming here um, uh, at anchor and attend to the passengers by uh, their own boat. Uh, you know, unusual weather for, uh, uh, let's say, in December and January. Uh, it's uh, windy uh, and the scene is more than a week, uh, almost two weeks. Uh, well, I hope next few days uh, it should calm down and we come to the regular, let's say, the fine Caribbean weather. When Christopher Columbus landed on this island in 1493, the summit of the mountain was shrouded in white clouds, evoking the snows, las nieves. From this strange vision in such southern latitudes, the small volcanic island got its name of Nevis. We pull into Charlestown, the island's peaceful capital, just as the ferry for St. Kitts is taking on its passengers. Generally, we get a lot of local people that work in St. Kitts and live in Nevis, and vice versa. But we have a lot of tourists also that uses the ferry. Even year-round, because they have tourists that fly in to St. Kitts year-round, and then some that come with a cruise ship. So it's a mix of people, and school children, because they have children that go to school in St. Kitts, the college, and they live in Nevis. So they traverse every day. This company has two boats. We do, we do some in, in, in the island trading. We do, we do the, the shopping trip. Like, we try to do it once a month. But over the Christmas season, it was like a lot of trips. Unlike St. Kitts, which was French during all of the 17th century, Nevis was only ever occupied by the English. This island, covered with rich plantations, was called the Queen of the Caribbean. But lovely homes were not the only thing that the colonial period left behind. On account of slavery, 
it left a deep scar in the minds of the islanders that only time will perhaps efface. This surely explains the place that religion holds in the Caribbean. In Nevis, far from the big cities open to the rest of the world, the inhabitants gather together in religious fervor and prayer, source of all their hopes. We are praying for you. Pray to him for yourself now. Glory be to God. We wait on you as you pray. Glory be to God. The worship team will just sing that refrain while we wait on you as you empty yourselves in your God. The old mills are gradually disappearing from the countryside that covers the slopes of the mountain, overrun by the tropical vegetation. The last sugarcane plantation stopped working in the 1930s. Peaceful Nevis. Too peaceful for its inhabitants who can't find work and have to emigrate to St. Kitts or Antigua. We're at sea again and headed in the direction of Les Sants Islands off the southern coast of Guadeloupe. It's become windy. In the olden days, the sailors would be busy with maneuvers, the captain would be tacking. In the days of sailing ships, the only enemy was a dead calm. But the Star Clipper is a cruise ship, and the captain has to bring his passengers into port on time. Over the past uh, few days, uh, we experienced kind of quite a heavy, heavy uh, wind uh, over the 40, 45 knots. Uh, so we sailed with a reduced uh, set of sails uh, for a certain reason. to maintain the tradition of the ships of, uh, of the 19th century. Uh, we used to sail as much as we can, uh, as you know, if uh, the condition is uh, favorable, uh, but we have to also think that um, and consider that we are the cruise ship at the same time. We're entering into the Bay of Les Saints Islands. Once again, it was Christopher Columbus who, upon discovering this island in November 1493, baptized it Los Santos in honor of the Holy Day.
It was only in 1648 that the French occupied this island, dominated since the 19th century by Fort Napoleon. Brush, cactus, thorn bushes, the vegetation and the climate seem more suited to iguanas than the sailors from Brittany, who came here in the 17th century with the idea of starting sugarcane plantations. It was a very inhospitable island here. There wasn't any water or anything. It's improved since, of course, but back then the Saints' islands were worthless for people. There was no source of water. It was wild. There were no dwellings. It was really barren except for a few colonial homes owned by the rich planters from Guadeloupe. There couldn't have been more than about 20 houses in all. I knew my grandparents very well. My grandfather was descended from slaves. He would row over to Guadeloupe. That makes 13 kilometers to row in all kinds of weather, because that was how it was. You had to row to go sell your catch. After that, they had sails, and then motors came in around 1956-58. The inhabitants of the Saints Islands have the reputation of being excellent seamen, a legacy of their ancestors from Brittany. The Santois, the swift and maneuverable traditional sailboats once used for fishing, have today given way to motorboats. But they haven't completely disappeared. Now they're racing boats, and they are revived at every regatta thanks to the initiative of a group of young islanders eager to keep up the traditions. Les Saints Islands, which were isolated for a long time, now attract a good number of visitors who come over from Guadeloupe by motorboat. The maritime history of Les Saints Islands started in the 1950s. Huge sailing ships started putting in here. Really old cruise ships that were strictly sail powered, no motor. We would go out in our skiffs to greet the people, but just in the bay with sailboats and rowboats. And once those travelers realized that we're really very friendly people, that's when tourism really took off in Les Saints Islands. The day is drawing to a close. Time for a last stroll through the village of Terre de Haut. Out in front of the stores, we can see the Salacos, quaint Chinese-looking straw hats that the fishermen of the islands used to wear. Now they're only souvenirs for curious tourists. In a little while, the ferry boat will head back to Guadeloupe. The Star Clipper will hoist anchor and leave the Bay of Les Saintes. Carrying the voyagers and their dreams towards another island lost somewhere in the middle of the Caribbean Sea. <laughs> <laughs>